to the introductions. I just wanted to read the description about this session. So Hawaii, like most states, has specific laws, regulations, and executive orders that govern the protection of personal information. Compliance is much more than just a technology issue. It is also a matter of organization-wide policies and processes necessary to safeguard private information. This session will clarify requirements, standards, strategies, and the varying legal drivers for security that apply to state agencies, municipalities, and their private sector contractors. So, let me formally introduce our panel today. To my immediate left is a Lieutenant Colonel Tony Carubin. So Tony is a cyberspace operations officer in the Hawaii Air National Guard. He also serves as the Hawaii Department of Defense Joint Force Headquarters, Deputy J6 Director of Command, Control, Communications, and Computers. Next, we have Jody Ito. Jody is the Information Security Officer for the University of Hawaii, and she's been doing that since 2000, and she's been with the university since 1982. Jody is responsible for all aspects of information security across the UH system, including the development and deployment of the UH Information Security Program. Next to Jody, we have Bob Smock. Bob is a senior director with Gartner and has over 30 years of IT experience and is currently leading the state and local government security team within Gartner. So prior to Gartner, Bob spent 17 years as the CISO and director of IT security for NASA's IT resources that supported space shuttle and space station operations. Then to the left of Bob, we have Dr. Christina Teidman. Dr. Teidman is the Data Governance Director for the Department of Education. She oversees the DOE's K-12 statewide longitudinal data system, as well as the data issues resolution and data quality processes. She provides the DOE with guidance on data sharing, research applications, and information privacy. So before we begin, I want to talk about how the uh, state transformation programs are segmented, and Sunny kind of referenced it this morning, how uh, there's a business, technology, and then governance. So this panel's discussion is on security and privacy, which is part of the technology aspect of the top 10 programs. That being said, I will turn it over now to our first speaker, Lieutenant Colonel Tony Carubin. Can everyone hear me? Are we good? Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I just wanted to uh, spend the next few minutes uh, sharing with you some of the uh, initiatives that uh, we're pursuing over here at uh, the State Department of Defense, not to be confused with the Federal Department of Defense. Uh, we're looking at, uh, or I'll just talk about these, these three things. Uh, we're hoping to bring in a cyber protection team, have that established within the state. We are uh, exploring with the University of Hawaii, the establishment of a Center of Excellence for Cybersecurity, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about PKI. So within the State Department of Defense, we have a cyber network defense team of uh, 10 people within the Army National Guard. That is our only cyber defense mission officially within the Hawaii National Guard. Even the Air National Guard, Hawaii Air National Guard, does not have a cyber defense mission. Uh, having said that, U.S. Cyber Command has recently established the creation of a, a cyber mission force. And among the, that force will be the creation of cyber protection teams by the National Guard. Uh, the National Guard has uh, some unique authority to operate under Title 32 and Title 10. Title 10 is what allows the active duty federal government to operate uh, for federal active duty military um, units. Title 32 is what authorizes the National Guard to operate within the state under uh, the state's governor uh, for various contingencies. 
Uh, the National Guard is proposing to establish 10 cyber protection teams, uh, one in each FEMA region. Uh, we are, our state is in FEMA Region 9, and we share that region with California, Nevada, and Hawaii. And uh, those are the states that we'll be competing with to uh, promote the establishment or, or, or have the, 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 the state be located in a, the, their particular state. Uh, as as uh, we uh, try to promote our state, the, the National Guard, we were looking at uh, certain types of criteria for, for putting that team into a particular state, like, for example, whether the uh, state can um, provide the, the number of personnel to sustain the team, where they can provide a uh, secure facility for conducting training exercises and so on. Uh, you know, definitely we're a target-rich state. We have every service component uh, base here, Army, Marine Corps, Navy, Air Force, everything. We've got the NSA here. I mean, we are a target-rich environment. So definitely there's a, a need to, to bring in that, that cyber protection team here. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we're collaborating with the UH to establish a security uh, a center of excellence. Uh, in August, we had a cyber range exercise that uh, um, brought together a whole bunch of people. And it, it, was, it was gratifying to see uh, this collaboration among uh, a diverse group of people to, to put together this cyber range exercise. Uh, we want to continue that uh, collaboration and that, that uh, co cooperation. Um, the uh, center of excellence I want to establish uh, uh, will have uh, a cyber range that we want to sustain and maintain so that we can continue to expand uh, the capability, the opportunities for, for providing cyber skills training within the state. Uh, we want to ensure that we have a, a skilled workforce pool for industry to be able to pull from. And, and uh, you know, we want to keep people here in Hawaii, essentially, uh, with, with skilled with a skilled workforce. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the, the getting back to the cyber range that we want to establish a, a, as a permanent thing, uh, that, that cyber range will be there as a community resource. We want it to be a, a place where uh, uh, organizations can conduct cyber exercises, uh, can conduct uh, simulations, do forensic analysis, uh, uh, investigate uh, best practices and strategies for doing cyber incident response and mitigation. Uh, in July of 18, I, I mean, I'm sorry, next year, uh, we're hoping to have our next cyber range uh, exercise, uh, July 18th through 20th, and we're hoping to see uh, uh, expanded participation from a number of uh, organizations and, and folks. Okay, so, uh, this, uh, this whole topic of PKI uh, came up uh, recently. No, no, no I, I shouldn't say recently, but um, our, our state adjutant general, General Wong, had asked a question one day, why can't he send and receive encrypted email with the governor, with other uh, cabinet members, um, and so on? And uh, the, it turned out that the, the, the answer to that question was not so easy. Um, as, as Probably most of you in the, in the audience probably know you're, you're an IT smart community. You, you know what the advantages of, of having a, a PKI capability are. And this is a digital government summit, so you know, the, the PKI will foster the ability to send in, 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 and receive encrypted and signed email. Uh, you know, the document processing within agencies, intra and inter-agency uh, document processing, and also just the plain old I identity management. Um, um, among other things, there, I'm sure there, you could come up with all kinds of reasons why PKI is something that we need to be doing and, and expanding. Um, but anyway, getting back to the real question of why the general could not use his federal CAC card to send encrypted and, and uh, signed email with, say, the, uh, the governor, uh, it, it all, all comes down to the ability to to do what we call cross-certification with the Federal Bridge Certificate Authority. The Federal Bridge is a, is a mechanism by which multiple federal agencies, other government agencies and organizations um, cross-certify the certificates such that you can send and receive uh, email that's uh, encrypted or signed. You can, 
you can distribute public keys, the certificates between those agencies and whatnot. And uh, a number of, of federal agencies have joined this uh, federal bridge, uh, including the federal DOD, um, multiple uh, other uh, three-letter agencies within the federal government. Um, it turns out that Illinois was the first state to establish cross certification with the federal bridge. And uh, I want to just talk a little bit about what they did. Uh, sometime, I think around, it was around 2001, they, the governor signed a law that established the legality and, uh, uh, of, of digitally signed documents. President Clinton had done something similarly for the feds at, uh, uh, I think it was right around, anyway, it was, it was, it, it, it came upon the heels of President Clinton's uh, signing on, on, on the federal side. So Illinois did something similar on the state side, but it turned out they didn't have anything that would actually um, uh, make use of that law. And, and so as, uh, when, when they, they signed this law, they realized, oh, now we have to support this. And as a result, uh, you know, more than a decade later, they now have the situation where they can actually process uh, documents. They have, they have issued 300,000 certificates to many, many state employees, private citizens, whatnot, for various ID management purposes. Um, they are the, the, the state that has gone the farthest in, in, in establishing that interoperability with the federal government. Um, and and it's, it's, it's actually quite amazing what they've done. They, within the, the, their, their, their uh, the, 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 the security tokens that they, they provide have multiple levels of assuredness, uh, depending on whether you can submit, um, provide a, a, a driver's license and other types of certificates to, 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 um, to, to, as, as credentials. Uh, as I said, it's a decade-long effort. It was a, uh, they, they have a staff of five, and uh, two of that staff uh, are actually contractors. And, uh, you know, as, as we look to see how we want to do PKI within the state, uh, we probably want to um, uh, look at what they've done and hopefully not repeat some of their mistakes. Uh, the uh, the uh, requirements for establishing that cross certification is quite stringent. There are, there are stringent audit requirements uh, to establish that uh, initial certificate that is actually federally recognized by the, by the federal law. Uh, government and um, you know it's it's one of those things where you you have to actually hire someone that uh, uh, really knows what's going on um, but but anyway in closing uh, so so we're gonna proceed with uh, trying to get that uh, cyber protection team established in the state of Hawaii uh, we're looking to send uh, some documentation up in, in next month to, to you know say Hawaii we we want that team here uh, and again, in uh, July of next year, we're hoping to have our next cyber range exercise. We hope to see some of you smart security <laughs> folks out there participating in the exercise. Uh, maybe Jody can mention a little bit about that. Some more. And then, of course, we're going to continue to pursue this uh, cross certification with the federal government. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony. Uh, so thank you very much for staying here so late and being with us. Um, however, yes, security is very important, so just do it, okay? Um, but, uh, I want to thank the ITS, the group that's here to keep me on the straight and narrow. I appreciate your support here, so standing ovation at the end for all of us, please. But, um, but what I'm here to talk about specifically is how we at the University of Hawaii are working on protecting uh, the privacy of our community's information as well as improving the security. Um, basically what I wanted to do is we, we had a reason to do it. So um, a few years ago, you may have remembered that the University was, of Hawaii was in the news for a, a few data breaches and then we got hit with a class action lawsuit. Um, nothing like a little momentum and impetus to, to get us going on this. But what we did really was to take it as an opportunity 
to really look at what we're doing at the university. And I think we're not unlike many of the agencies within the state because we're highly decentralized. There are many, many different roles of authorities and basically a lot of people can go out and do their own things, which made it very, very difficult for us to really know where information is and how to protect it. So what we started with was basically an external information security assessment. So it's not like a, an audit, but it was a consultant coming in, interviewing high level administrators, uh, interviewing people down in the department's rank and file, people who are actually doing the work, and then trying to, and this is across all of our campuses, um, so we're trying to understand the scope of our problem. So we call it an information security posture assessment. So this was done at the tail end of 2010. And basically, you know, it was a fairly detailed document that came back with a number of specific recommendations in it. But largely, it was an underinvestment in terms of security resources. And that was both people, because back then I was the only information security person for the entire system. Uh, as well as underfunded. We didn't actually have any budget for information security. However, we had to protect it. Well, at that point, I had to protect everything. But um, also, it was so decentralized. We had personnel files in, in individual departments and campuses. Um, each campus had separate data repositories, which were essentially copies of the institutional system data. And so we were trying to manage this across the entire system. So just to note that you know, our data breaches were actually on different campuses. So it's not that one campus had multiple breaches because we, we tend to learn from these things. But again, it was because there was all of these independent operations going on. So this was the overarching recommendation, which basically said we really need to stand up something across the entire system so that everybody understands the importance about protecting university sensitive information. And that is not unlike what all of you are going through now with state agencies, right? We need to define first what is sensitive information and then understand the risk associated with that information having either an unauthorized disclosure or for perhaps a hacker coming in and, and grabbing our information. So this was the central thing that came out of it, which now meant that we needed to do something at a system level where we developed this information security program. So we had actually looked at each one of the particular instances of a breach that we had and these are the five key areas that we considered to be important or may have been lacking uh, as to why we resulted in a breach. So a lot of it is data governance and oversight. So uh, for those of you who attended the data governance portion, talked this morning with uh, Dr. Tideman, really it is very, very important to understand where your data is, what data is in play, who owns it, and make sure you understand the flow of data throughout your environment. Um, without that, you don't know where your data is going, who has it, how long they have it, are they passing it on to somebody else? Did the contractor who gra grabbed it, used it, did they destroy it at the end of their contract? Really, so you want to make sure you have as little exposure of your data as much as possible. And that can only be possible through something like a data governance process. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next few slides. The other thing we looked at is how do we assess our risk, right? We need to understand if people are using data, do they understand what they need to do to protect it? And in many cases, we found out not. So um, we also had to go back and look at our policies and procedures in more detail. And the other thing we're building in is a little bit about our identity management and access control. So Lieutenant Colonel Karubin talked about how they're looking at implementing uh, public key infrastructure, or PKI, where you have certificates in, uh, issued to individuals to establish a known trust relationship, right? So um, we're looking around things in that, maybe not PKI, but um, somewhere, some things in that space. And then very, very important is the awareness, training and awareness. Everywhere you go, all of the best practices, you have to make sure people understand how important this stuff is. So uh, talk a little bit about that too. So we also put in 
con in place something called uh, our governance process. So we've established a data security leadership council, which is comprised of senior administrators from each of the campuses who are appointed by their chancellors with the specific responsibility of protecting the data on their campus. They are responsible for ensuring compliance with the security program. So this is how we're trying to in, uh, have some centralization over our decentralized campuses. And then the other people we need to involve are all the technical people in the field who have to do all the technical stuff that we're making them do. So we're calling together this other group called the UHIT Security Leads Group. And there we actually talk about, okay, we're gonna roll out Identity Finder, make sure you install it in the machines and scan with it, and here's how you would use it. So we're trying to help them with more of the technical requirements that then get pushed out through policies and procedures. Uh, data governance is again one of the large keystones of our entire security program. We need to make sure that you know, our data flow is understood and everybody who handles it along the process also understands the significance of uh, securing it. So um, it also is complementing our basic set, uh, protection of sensitive information policy 2.214. So what we're trying to do also is align our policies across the entire university system to incorporate data governance into everything. So the broad overview of our data governance policy is we define what institutional data is and establish the principles, roles and, uh, roles and responsibilities, and then trying to define the best practices. So again, providing accountability for the use of data. So if um, one of our campuses wants to use another campus's data for perhaps a comparison report across the two campuses, the first campus needs to ask that second campus if it's okay. Second campus has the right to say no, and that has happened in the past. So also, uh, when we're working with other agencies, for example, the Department of Education, we're working on this project, the P20 project, which is a longitudinal data study from K-12 up through the university into the workforce. How is that data protected across all of this? So, you know, we have to have all of these memorandums of understanding and back and forth, a lot of negotiations, but really it helps us understand how the data is being used, where the risks are as it gets passed from agency to agency, and the agencies understand that we need to protect it. And again, we want to reduce the risk by having unnecessary copies of the data, right? And that's going to be a harder one, but we're working on that. Um, and then quality of data. By making sure that you have a single source of the data, the data owner can control it and ensure that it is good data. Right. So in, in short, basically the process is this, you know, um, we're creating something called a UH data sharing request procedure, which we have a long form and a short form, I won't go into the details, but basically it's a work in progress, where if somebody wants to use institutional data, you have to ask permission and you have to tell us why you're using it and what you're gonna do when you're done with it. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Again, we're working through the processes um, and we're just astounded by the number of places our data is going in terms of contracts, in terms of cloud, in terms of people just thinking they can use it just cause. Um, so again, this is the awareness process. So as the various people within all of our uh, ITS, our IT infrastructure group, our developers, our programmers, you know, we talk about this within information technology services because as they hear it from their customers, we can all share this. So this is why it's really important for us as an institution to be able to make sure that everybody understands what we're doing. Other thing we're doing is around audits and risk assessment. So we're actually working with our internal audit unit and we've identified key areas which really handle a lot of sensitive information, one of which we did an internal audit uh, last year which was for our student financial aid information. So you have student information, social security numbers, parents' financial information. So they handle a lot of very, very highly regulated data. So we did a survey and then the, all of the financial aid offices on all of the campuses had to respond and it was a fairly detailed survey. And then following up, we did an on-site visit to make sure that some of the physical securities and controls were being abided by. 
Um, but it does, did point out some things to us that we don't have a system-wide records management policy. So that's something now that we're going back and, and revisiting. And then largely what we want to do is across our critical systems or critical servers that contain highly confidential information, we'd like to do an external assessment of these every two to three years. We tried to create a portal to our information security information, and one of the pages on that portal is our policies, because we want to make it easy for people to find all of the specific policies that may relate to their use of the data. Um, and additionally, as new things come up, uh, this year's audit is around HIPAA information, so, and we do not have a system-wide HIPAA policy. That's the next thing we're working on. Uh, PCI DSS is coming into play. And then also, we really need to revisit all of the policies to have that continuum of both the language and the philosophies that goes through everything. You know, the policies are going to be your, basically, your, 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 your keystone to everything. Because without a policy, how are you going to make people comply or make them understand what they need to do? So you need to have a policy in place, and then you need to have the procedures that follow it. Um, our security and awareness training. We developed it in-house uh, largely because we needed to accommodate so many different things from the university perspective that is probably a little bit different than, say, some of the commercial offerings. All we did was built it in a current learning, learning management system, which is open source Sakai, and we're making people pass with 70%. So that's kind of low, but, you know, we're going to ramp it up. So we want to bring people in, you know, not kicking and screaming immediately, and then we plan to uh, redo the curriculum every two years. But the other thing we're doing is we're also mandating according to the use of the data that people have to take this training. So if you use our student information system, you are required to go through this training. So that will take about two to 3,000 people. Um, uh, we've had people within our institutional research and analysis office be required to go through the training. So we're trying to do it within their areas of uh, roles and responsibilities where they touch the data. Okay. And then we're trying to also require our third party vendors to take the training. So that's a page on our training. Um, the slides will be up online. But the other thing we're doing with this is our identity management and access control. So we're trying to build it in where all of the requirements that you either take the training or sign all of these acknowledgements are done online and it's easily trackable. And the goal with this is down the road, and this is a homegrown system, is that eventually, if you do not meet the requirements for the training or the acknowledgements, we will then turn off your account. So we, that would be the big stick. We're working towards that. We're not there now. But we feel that that would be the ultimate where, you know, that's the big stick at the end where people really realize that we're, we're serious about it. Um, Password strengthening, always an ongoing problem. And then the multi-factor authentication, uh, we're currently also investigating certificates, as Lieutenant Colonel Karubin mentioned, for the guard. Um, but there's a problem with that. How do you issue them? How do you make sure that the person who got it is really the person, the right person? Um, but if nothing else, we're looking at some, some sort of PIN system, too. So lots of work in progress. Um, and this is just a snapshot of what the, our Acer service looks like. So if you log in with your username and password, it will then present to you the things that you can either uh, have taken the training on or if you have to do what we call electronic certifications, you acknowledge some sort of policies or procedures. Um, other things we're doing is making sure that around the risk of the data that's involved, we're requiring people to register that repository of information. Actually, that first element is required by our Hawaii state uh, laws, the Hawaii revised statute. As an agency of the state, we are required to register every single instance of personal information that the university holds. Um, the second thing we're doing is requiring registration of servers, as well as the scanning of the servers, both for PII, personally identifiable information, as well as for vulnerabilities. So this is an ongoing process. But at that end of that, end of every year, we generate a report that's sent to the campuses and the, the Campus Data Security Leadership Council member, and they need to authorize that it is indeed a legitimate instance for that server to be up and running with that information on it. Um, this is ongoing. It's a, it's a continuous process. 
Um, we actually had the consultant come back in and do another security posture assessment, and I'm happy to say we showed significant progress. So um, it is, it's been about three years since we first implemented the program. So, and the, I guess the progress will be slow, but anecdotally, we actually get feedback because people will say, oh, so-and-so, I saw them using a social security number here, is this okay? Or they're sending this kind of information in email, is that okay? So the fact that the, the rank and file are asking questions really means that the awareness has been raised. Um, the other thing I think we wanted to talk about very end is what uh, Lieutenant Colonel Karubin mentioned is our cyber range. So that is where we're creating an, a virtual environment where we set up business IT infrastructure and we have attackers and we have defenders and it provides people an opportunity to try to understand what an exact what an attack looks like and how you would then defend against it. So this first one was in August this year and next one is July 18th through 20th next year. Um, and this range though is again, it's new, we're building it up from scratch. And along with that though, uh, Tony also mentioned the Center of Academic Excellence. So we at the University of Hawaii, we're right now in the middle of this process of trying to establish a pathway through the university system for cybersecurity education. So you would be able to come in, either get an AAAS degree or continue on to a four-year degree, um, and all of the campuses are involved. So it's a work in progress, and hopefully we'll, at the end of it, have, be able to have people come out with a degree in either cybersecurity or information assurance. So that's my nutshell on it. Um, yeah, we'll be talking a lot more about that as time goes. So any questions or moving on? Moving, moving on. on, moving on. Okay, moving on. Thank you, Thank you Jody. Yes, Bob, you are next. So I lost the bet. I bet Matt Starbucks that at 2.45 in the afternoon on a sunny day that there wouldn't be anybody left here to come to this session. <laughs> That's because it's raining. <laughs> you haven't been outside in a while then because the sun is nice out there. Dude. Okay, I have a tendency to wave my arms and flail about so I don't want to hurt any of my colleagues on the panel so I'm gonna walk around down here a little bit. So what I'm after, uh, one of the other things, hey, cool, works good. This is a pretty dry topic. It's also pretty hard. It's hard for, for people to get their heads around. So that's kind of what they stuck me in here for. But somebody actually did good planning, Matt, because they stuck me after Jody, because this is what Jody talked about a lot, was getting your hands around your data. So what we're going to talk about is information classification. And I mean what it says up there. It's probably, in fact, I know for a fact, very few folks are doing it. During a security review conducted last year of all of the departments and agencies of the executive branch of the government here in the state of Hawaii, very few, very small percentage of those departments and agencies actually did any information classification, actually had a policy that was specific to the work that agency did, and even fewer actually had practices for doing any information classification. Why? Well, because it's not easy and sometimes it's not cheap. But there are also a lot of misconceptions about information classification that I want to try to address now so that maybe you can go back and actually progress along the path that Jody is now doing and then I can help my buddy Matt who's now got that responsibility for helping the state develop information classification uh, actually get this job done, okay? So you can see basically what, what the premise here is. Uh, a number of things. I did use the magic word transformational. Isn't that what this is all about? Isn't that what the state CIO's magic word is? IT transformation in the state. And yes, information classification can be a part of that. So let's see how. By the way, I haven't told Jody this, 
But as part of that assessment that was done last year, we, Jody and her group were peripherally involved in the assessment. We actually found Jody and her program, her only two-year-old pro program at the time, to be pretty robust and mature given where they had started from. In fact, we found them significantly more robust and mature than any of the other 18 agencies in the executive branch of the government that we were looking at. So nice job, Jody. Oh, thank you, and we're expanding our data classification, by the way. Cool. <laughs> okay. Or maybe not. Am I too far away? Shall we drive? I'll drive for you. Okay. Hey, it worked once. Okay. okay. All right. I copied Matt's chart and I modified it a little bit. All right. Matt said that this topic, and as you know, as the title says, you know, part of the security and privacy track. However, information classification, again, as Jody was alluding to, isn't necessarily restricted to only security. In fact, it's more appropriately applied to information governance and data governance. It's just one of the positive side effects is you can use it to improve your security and privacy. So take that as what you're going to see over the next few minutes. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about data governance, right? Because that's where truly where information classification falls. I've been in security for 30 years. I always got to tell war stories, right? There are a whole bunch of them up there. I won't go into it. If you're sitting in the back, I'm sorry. I know you like the back seats, but you probably can't read all the small text. Your problem, not mine. All right. For all you guys in the front, you can see all the different war stories. You will see a couple of states up there. Right? I have worked in those states because of what I do. Uh, one state in particular, actually not reflected on that chart, Christmas Eve called me and said, Bob, we're about to show up in a newspaper article that shows all of the breaches that we've had recently, and it's not going to reflect favorably on us. Can you please come help us build a plan to dig us out of this hole? That's what I do. I, I'm the fireman, I come in, I, help, I do assessments, and I help people build roadmaps to get out of the problems where they are. One of those items is always information classification. And so, of course, I'm telling war stories. You need to address your security and privacy problems. I'm just going to point out one of the aspects to do that. There are many. Colonel pointed out PKI encryption. Jody pointed out her program. Lots of ways to do it, but if you want to do it right, if you want to do it and not spend too much money, who has too much money in their agency? <laughs> yeah, I knew the answer to that one. Okay, that's what we're after, right? Doing things right, doing things efficiently, doing things appropriately. That's what information classification helps us do. Very kind of straightforward, what is information classification? Otherwise known as information categorization. Not to be confused with the gentleman in the uniform who would call classified information something completely different, those of you in the military. Right? That's not what this is about. This is about the categorization of data. Right? Now, let me give you the war story, another war story here. Right? I think Matt introduced a little bit of my NASA background, I think. Uh, I was chief information security officer with the space shuttle program for a long time. Way back in the day, the shuttle launched in 1980. First one launched in 1980, and 15 years of development before that. In the spirit of cooperation with all of the nations of the world, France, Germany, Canada, and at that time, the Soviet Union, the United States government, in its infinite wisdom, decided all information related to the space shuttle would be made public, obviously, if, uh, with the exception of the military, the top secret military data that was flying on the shuttles at the time, but all of the other information would be public. Anybody want to tell me what happened in 1983, 1984? All right, come on, I know there's some old people in here like me. Come on. Okay. What happened in that time frame was the previous Soviet Union rolled out their version of the space shuttle. The government was aghast. And so they came to me and said, Bob, said, tell us what it would take to categorize all of our information so that we can take off the market. Remember, the Cold War was still going on. The Berlin Wall was still up. How can we take our information off the market? So we went off and did our assessment, and we came back and we said, eh, no problem, we can do it. $50 million. <laughs> and they went, meh, Bob, we'll go with plan B. Plan B is what? 
protect all the information the same way. So therefore, no information was available on the space shuttle. All right? Now, is that good or bad? Might be good, might be bad. You do want to share some information. But the point was they were spending a lot of money using encryption technology to protect data that probably could have been public. All right? So again, efficient approach, cost-efficient approach of protecting your data. That's what we're after. Go ahead, Jody. Thank you. Here's your test. We won't write down any answers, and I won't ask you about it, but can any of you do that quickly and easily in whatever jobs are you doing right now? Any of those questions can you answer? My guess is few and none. That's what we're after here. Information classification is going to help us address those items. As the little blue box says, and as I pointed out at the beginning, not easy, not fast, but absolutely essential if you want to do it right, and if you want to do it, I'm going to call it cheaply, efficiently, all right? But the goal is to be able to do those things. Now, what are a lot, I pointed out, you can see the little parentheticals there that point out what the security aspects of a lot of those things are, but how, how many of you could use faster search engines or faster way to retrieve data, or when somebody asks you a specific question, how to actually go get that data without a lot of hassle, right? Information classification is the way you address those items. Go ahead. Now, a lot, again, a lot of text, a lot of color, just because I knew I'm doing this presentation in the middle of the afternoon, and you're starting to sag like everyone else, right? It's been a little while since you've been across the street to the Starbucks, right? Me too, right? So a little bit of color, a lot of text, right? But read the text if you can. Start at the top. Notice the first seven or, six or seven items have nothing to do with security. Right? Storage management. How many of you have multi-tiered storage architectures where one level is the expensive random access right away I can get to it and the rest of it is archived off so it's cheaper and you're not spending as, as much of your department's money? What? No one has that? Okay. Not everybody does. I get it. But that's kind of the approach that as we're going to transform how we do business in the state, to effectively use our money, we're going to have to get into that mindset when we re-architect our data centers and our ERP systems and our information processing systems. Right? Knowledge management, you know, how quickly can you retrieve data that somebody asks for specifically? In my spare time, I do e-discovery stuff. Right? That's when there's a lawsuit or something and someone says, I need all of the email going back 15 years on this person. How many of you can retrieve all of that data and how quickly can you do it? Or do you just turn over all 10,000 hard drives and go, here, Mr. Attorney, you look at it. And the attorney will charge you $250 an hour to search through all those things and find everything he needs. Not an efficient use of our money. It's finally not till we get way down at the bottom, compliance and access control, and in some cases, risk management, that we actually start talking about how information classification can help us in the security realm. Obvious, not so obvious, so let's talk about how we actually get there. Jody, thank you. Why do information classification? All right, I pointed out a bunch, but let's talk about some practical realities. Hit it again. It makes good business sense. I just kind of rambled on for five or 10 minutes about use the efficient and effective use of your limited dollars. You are a public institution in state government. You need to do that. Tax dollars don't grow on trees. Again, it's the law. That's always the big hammer, right? All right, now. All of those things I listed there are just a few random sampling of the applicable laws to the various and sundry departments and agencies here in the state. None of them actually say, go do information classification. All of them say, here's the type of information you need to do certain things with. How do you know and how can you find that type of information? Most of the organizations that I work with that have had data breaches tell me we have been depending on the knowledge and goodwill of our employees to know what the data is and to know how to take care of it. How many of you ever watched the X-Files? Show of hands. Come on, don't be shy. Okay, thank you. What's the favorite saying from the X-Files? I'm a security guy. I, I use this term all the time. Trust no one. Not even your own employee. War story. 
First time I did a presentation at NASA, accrediting systems. I established a whole program in Houston, Texas. That's where I'm from. Established a whole program at the Johnson Space Center, Manned Space Flight Center in Houston, Texas. And then I was given the task of expanding my program across NASA. My first stop was the Kennedy Space Flight Center in Florida. And I walked on there, and I walked in, and I did my first presentation. And again, I'm old, so we were dealing in hard copy back then. And I had my presentation physically thrown at me. Why? Because I was basically accusing their employees of not doing due diligence on taking care of the information. And that director took his badge off, his NASA badge off, and shook it at me and said, but we all wear these badges. We're all trustworthy. And I'm going, eh. Guess what my first job was in 1980 when I first started doing security? It was prosecuting a NASA employee <laughs> for illegally leaving his job. All right? He quit his job, but kept his system administrator rights to the system that he had access to. And there was a federal indict indict indictment against him. And he went to prison for 10 years. That was my first job against a NASA employee. Right? So that was my response to the director. The director was not a director for very much longer, and my program succeeded. <laughs> One more. All right. It allows you to protect information commensurate with its importance or value. Again, I keep harping on this point because it is the key point with information classification. You don't want to spend too much protecting data that's not worth it, and you don't want to spend too little protecting data that really needs it. Next slide. Here's my transformational chart, right? Talked a lot about technology, a lot about programs, about how you would go about protecting information. I think everybody knows, you know, here's how you do encryption, PKI, all that stuff. But when and why should you do it, right? Look at the blue box at the bottom. You want to start with the business case. Frankly, not everybody needs to do information classification. You don't have a lot of sensitive data, hey, no need to do it but probably not for state government. You guys are the keepers of all of the data, right? You're even the keeper of some of my data. I lived back here in the 70s. I'll bet you some of you still have my data, right? I had a driver's license back then. Yes, I am really old. You want to start with the business case and then move across to the things that you know really well, right? How do you, what do you encrypt? And so let, let's determine whether you need to do it or not, what the impact is, Maybe you don't need to classify everything in your environment, but know what you need to classify and, need, and then apply your security controls to it. Next one. Okay, another really eye chart. I'm assuming these charts are going to be available at some point on the website or something. Please. You would agree? Right, okay. So hopefully you'll be able to read this on your own time. But again, information classification doesn't have to be that hard. Right. If you look on there, I have four scenarios, if you will, of the type of folks that do information classification, all the way from the one first person that says, eh, we only have one or two types. It's either sensitive or it's not, all the way to the guy, some, some might call that last person a little bit anal, because he's got all of these different categories, and he's trying to uh, put, stick all of his information in certain categories. I was with a client Tuesday who told me that in his, his organization, and it was a trans, transportation organization in another state, uh, had over 100 categories of information that they tried to handle. And the next thing out of his mouth was, we tried information classification, and it was a terrible failure. And I went, hey, no lie. All yeah, right, OK. 100 categories, that's a little hard. Even the federal government only has less than half a dozen, and that's the goal. Make it simple. Make it something your organization can use. Pick the model that works for you. As my friend Jody said, just do it. How to get started? All right, notice my toolbox. Right. Some of you are going, OK, Bob, you've convinced me. Ten minutes, ten minutes listening to you. You are such a convincing speaker. I need to do information classification. I'm just going to run out and talk to these vendors and find out how much I need to spend and what tool I need to put in place. Eh, stop. Right? You do see the blue box, right? right? Automation only helps us do the bad things faster. <laughs> right, so first of all, create your process. Right? Make sure your process is clean, that it actually works, that you can actually categorize your information, and that it's actually useful, and then have Jody, heck, Jody and her team come in and assess your process, right? since they're doing it. 
I always use the, the voice of experience. Once you get there, then you can think about, hey, what tool can I use? Because right, remember, it will be tools, not necessarily the categorization of data. That automated tools can help you find data if you've got it spread all over the place, like Jody has found out. It's everywhere, especially cloud these days. It's going to be everywhere. And then you've got to market and label it, and you can use SharePoint or other repositories in order to do that. Right? But that's what you want to do. Label that data so that you can make use of it. Have your other automated technologies, like bridges, routers, gateways, identity management, all being able to see that label and take an action upon it. That's the goal here. That's the ultimate goal. Use the automation. I said I've been in security for 30 years. Basically, in those 30 years, I'm an insurance salesman. I tell people to put controls in place, and hopefully nothing bad will happen to them. However, in my realm, there are two areas where there are actually return on investment. The first one is identity and access management. Both of the first two speakers are actually working in that direction. You can reduce the number of system administrators that you need managing your accounts by automating your identity and access management processes. That's the first one. What's the second one? Automating your information classification and use cases, right? Using the technology to process store, retrieve, manage your data. Last slide. I'm going to end with this. Get away from information classification. All right. Again, I am a security professional. How many other security professionals in here? How many of you consider yourself or have a CISSP or any of that stuff? Eh, a couple of guys. OK, cool. This is kind of one of the things that we live by. I ask you to look at the date of that book, 1990. It's one of the first books I read in the 80s, uh, The Cuckoo's Nest. Anybody read Cuckoo's Nest? I see people laughing, all right? All right? This is the next one that came out that reaffirmed everything that we had seen back in the early days of information security. But is this not true? I get accused of telling war stories that are unrealistic, all right? Well, then I turn around and I accuse managers of being not prudent, and in fact, some of them negligent, in the management of their data and the, and the execution of their responsibilities and accountabilities for the people that gave them that data in the first place. Guess what you guys have? That same accountability for the citizens of your state. So I emphasize information classification is one of those places you want to start. With that, I will finish. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Okay, next up we have Dr. Tybin. Well, that's a tough act to follow, and so I won't even claim to be following it well. <laughs> so thank you. Um, as usual, I come away from these kinds of meetings with a long laundry list of things I need to do and think about. So I, I want to acknowledge Jody's um, description of the educational environment, which for the K-12 um, Department of Education, the K-12 Department of Education is very similar to the post-secondary. And because of that, we've had a lot of very meaningful conversations and uh, collaborative efforts looking at this issue. The one difference that we have with the K-12 environment is that we have minors, mm -hmm. and parents are understandably and rightfully very protective of their students' information. And so that is one of the pieces that makes our situation a little bit different than um, others. As we are one, the largest employer in the state, we also have a lot of turnover, a lot of constantly training people on new ideas and new practices, and changing traditional practices into more innovative or responsive practices. Uh, so, so some of the laws that we've seen flashed up and some other ones I've added um, all seem to apply. The big ones for education, of course, are the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act and IDEA, which has additional privacy uh, considerations for individuals with disabilities. But these rules for us are um, the floors. They're not the ceiling. 
They are the minimum expectation for uh, maintaining privacy for students and the records. And for us, the golden standard is parental consent. Before we release any information, we ideally want to have parental consent. There are other provisions in the law that allow, in uh, FERPA, that allow for release of information, but if at all possible, parental consent comes into play. So with the classification of data, and um, we do still work with a lot of hard copies for, with students, and as it's moving into a digital environment, that will be changing, but we do still need to be aware of the volume of hard copy data that is within our system. And generally, personally identifiable information is one of our key issues. Often we get the question, well, can you just give us a list of PII so we know what it is and then we don't have to worry about it? The problem is that PII is um, a combination piece. It's a risk factor. So your name by itself is not a PII element, but when you combine name and, say, a test score, then it becomes personally identifiable information because it increases the risk of harm to that individual. So, but the assessment score by itself is not PII. So it's all about the matching and the com combining, and that's where it gets very complicated for educational data. So our frequent requesters, we get a lot of requests from the school communities. So the school community councils who are the non-professionals, the non-education professionals who are working with the schools to guide their academic financial plans, how the, what is happening with the schools. And they want to see real information and they want to see it at a level where they feel it's actionable. So school community councils are very interested in getting um, school level data, uh, individual level data or school level data. We also have a lot of requests from analysts and researchers for these data. And one of the challenges with this is that receiving discrete data files may be fine, but when those data files are merged or matched with other data files, it could generate that mosaic effect that Sunny mentioned earlier um, that allows identifiable information to come into play when before it was not that way. We also have a lot of outside agencies and companies. Uh, education is a large market for vendors and there is a heightened interest in developing technological tools to assist schools and parents and students to do the, what they need to do and to engage in the learning environment, implementation of guidelines or security practices. And so there's a lot of um, focus on assisting the complex areas, the teachers, the principals, to understand what needs to be in place, not just procedurally, but um, as far as agreements, language, and contracts to make it all legal and appropriate for sharing of data. Um, we also get a lot of requests from the media, which I know many of us in this room are affected by, and of course the advocates, so the, the lawsuits I heard. Um, that is also one of the areas we get a lot of requests for information that can be used to train the department or to make the department aware of issues that might be throughout. So um, one of the things that's currently happening, and I know it is, is affecting many of you in this room, is that natural tension between we want everything to be transparent and we want you to be able to provide services at the drop of a hat and be able to know exactly what all of the individuals need to be able to provide those services, click of a button kind of service delivery, opposed to privacy. So we want you to be able to do that, but we don't want anybody to know what's being done. And we want you to do it without the data that you need. You can't collect that data because then that becomes the big national database. So there's a lot of concern, particularly with student level data, that it's going in to create these national databases, the big brother effect, basically. And um, so even though things like open data and big data are in topics and collaborative assessment databases and third-party vendor products, you might have heard in Bloom, that's been in the headlines a lot lately, and our statewide longitudinal data systems, even though none of those 
have to do with building national databases, there's a perception that they do. And so a lot of the energy is fighting and um, demystifying what these uh, efforts are, how they provide assistance, what, how, what they will be used for, what they won't be used for, and the limitations within that. So there's a, a real um, hot debate and national attention related to these ideas of collecting more data than is needed and how it's being protected, used, shared, and who has access to it. So for us, some of the key things are not just the technological standards say, and safeguards, but also how do we create the guidelines and the resources to support the implementation of those and the fidelity of those. We can build the technological safeguards. That actually is probably the easier part, but it's making sure that they aren't circumvented or um, partially implemented and that they're followed because the the human element is the tricky element for us. We also do have guidelines related to suppression, redaction, limited access. We've been working with our single sign-on um, portal to reduce the number of different uh, implementation of access levels or um, security pieces. So once again, we were talking about the in the earlier presentations, talking about streamlining things, not having so many opportunities or portals or entry points for information. Uh, also, as uh, Jody mentioned, developing confidentiality agreements, not just with employees or as well as employees, but also um, with the users, those researchers, the uh, school community councils, media if need be, vendors, all of those making sure that the appropriate confidentiality agreements are in place and that they are monitored to ensure that. Also, data sharing agreements, um, slightly different than confidentiality agreements, but FERPA requires certain language to be uh, contained within any sharing of data, and we need to make sure that that is in place. Uh, data ethics. It's not just about what can you get access to, but what do you do when you have access to that? And for educators, just because you have access to the data, does that mean that you can use it for other purposes than what your job says you can use it for? and how to train related to that. So on training, ongoing training, we have a security training, annual security training for principals and vice principals and other administrators. We have um, training for all employees on FERPA. We have confidentiality trainings and, and more and more are coming along. The <laughs> trick though for us is managing the volume of training that's needed and the amount of time that's available for that training in conjunction with all of the other pieces. So very um, tricky to implement. And then the monitoring and audit. So we also did an information privacy internal audit this year. And um, it didn't make the paper, so that should tell you that it probably it went pretty well. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that we don't have areas that we want to improve. Always, whenever we have an audit, it's our opportunity to look at the information and um, see what practices or, or trainings could be um, helpful. We also have implemented technological audits, so not just the procedure audits, but things behind the scenes, who's getting in and looking at the files, the individual student records in different systems, um, looking at it from different perspectives. So from the in, uh, employee level, how many records are they looking at? From the student level, how many individuals are looking at that individual record? Those types of things. So. Um, doing some cross-domain type uh, looks, searches. So we have information. If you're interested in knowing more about the K-12 educational resources, we do have our data governance office. And one of the pieces that we implemented related to security was just the establishment of a data governance office. And in that office, we brought together areas that we deem to be at risk for release of information. So we have not only our longitudinal data system there, we have our research applications and approvals, we have external data requests are contained within there. And um, one that is surprising to people is our grants. Mm -hmm. um, are also within our data governance office because grants more and more now are requesting um, student information or data up front to get the grant and then there's a promise of providing data 
at the um, culmination of the grant or throughout the grant. And so it's been become very important for us to be able to collaborate between those groups to be, make sure that information is not being released inappropriately or promised inappropriately through any of those means. So um, these are contact information for the department, resources, and um, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Um, I would like to actually open the floor up uh, if there's any questions for our panel. Right in front. Any other questions? I know it's late in the afternoon, but I... <laughs> All right, I'll ask a question then. No, no. <laughs> you know, I guess there's a lot of experience here in going through the data classification and categorization process. You know, I guess for the you know, departments out there, you know, was there any lessons learned in terms of, you know, things that really stood out that will help, you know, our audience not make the same mistake or, you know, things of that nature. I would say one, I think the one that caught, when we were conducting the assessment last year, the one that caught us off guard the most were the departments and agencies that claimed, even though they collected a lot of the state information that's already been pointed out in a couple of the presentations, that they claimed they had no sensitive information or no confidential information or no private information. I, which for a state government agency, with a very few exceptions, I was aghast at that concept. But again, you know, I used the word transformational in the presentation simply because that's what this is all about. It's about workplace culture change. And if we've come from a culture where we haven't managed our sensitive information very well, that's the crux of the matter. Right? And we can't get there just winging it and so an information classification structure gives you that framework, gives you that structure to start changing more than just protecting your information, but to start changing that culture into a secure type culture or a privacy, a culture that protects privacy uh, appropriately. So that's uh, right along the lines of what you're saying. You already have frameworks. There are a number of them. One of the keys is, and back to specifically to your question, Matt, one of the keys is while the state or other august bodies and agencies can levy requirements or even give you a framework. Remember, the framework has to be specific to the work that you do in your agency, to what you do for a living. So it's to take that umbrella policy and then define it for how you actually can use it and, and make it applicable to what you do. That's the key lesson learned to me, other than please stop saying I don't have any sensitive data. <laughs> But uh, to be fair, I think we all come from that space where we don't know we have sensitive information. And when they rolled out Hawaii Revised Statute 487N that specifically stated which data elements in combination, um, if there was an unauthorized disclosure, would be a breach, that helped us get that process rolling. So at the university, we just started with two. It was public or sensitive. Um, and within the three, actually probably about four or five years now, um, we have a need to expand that category. So as I mentioned, we're now going to be, we're looking at expanding it to four categories. So we're doing something, there's still the public, we're doing something that's called um, university restricted. It's kind of sensitive, but we need to use it more freely within our university environment. 
uh, we still have that same sensitive category, but we've now expanded it on the, on the high end, saying it's a highly regulated category. So that's where the HIPAA data would fall in, the PCI, DSS, anything that would necessitate a breach notification should that information be leaked. So um, there is a refinement process that will be going, uh, you'll be going through, and, and we could consider this to be an ongoing reiterative process, so. Any other questions? All right, well, I have one more then. I knew that was coming. <laughs> Last question. So if the users are asked to classify or categorize their data, it's almost like you're placing your trust in them to give that information up. Are there, uh, have you used tools or technology to categorize or classify systems and data, you know, at a higher level where you can automate that and? To some extent. Obviously, everything has to have a starting point when you do data classification. There are some things like you guys have heard of data loss prevention technology, you know, where, you know, the succinct strings like credit card numbers, social security numbers, things like that, you can automate to to identify as being a certain type of data. But, you know, frankly, the bottom line is we do have to trust the people, even though I, I uh, cavalierly made the comment about not trusting anyone, that's not entirely true. We all have to trust everybody at some point. You are state employees for a reason. You know, now execute your due diligent responsibility and categorize the data. What we don't want is you categorizing data and you categorizing data and you categorizing data all differently. What we're after is to establish a consistent framework so that we can consistently categorize the data. Okay, great. One last chance for last questions. Okay. Well, before I conclude, I just want to let everybody know that immediately following this session, there's a 15 minute break followed by an awards program in the Coral Ballroom, so rooms three, four, and five, and then an awards reception in the exhibit area. So that being said, this uh, concludes this session. I wanna thank our panel today for all your uh, insight and knowledge, and uh, I guess a big round of applause for all these, for our members. All right, thank you everyone.